but it's the same thing. They have to go off into a very deep place before they can come out. It's kind of like that scene in Lord of the Rings when almost all is lost and they say, look to the east on the fifth day. And they look and there's Gandalf. But they had to get to a horrible place for that to really have such an effect. Because if they had just been in a little skirmish, it wouldn't have mattered that much. But the fact that they went to their full extent, they said, we're going to sacrifice everything we have for good in order to get, you know, in order to defeat evil. That's why that dawn was such a miraculous thing. And you can watch it. I don't know if you like Lord of the Rings, but I'll sit there and watch it. And I just get chills every single time. For every reader you have, that's the best way to spread word of mouth. And so I'm like, if I take care of my readers, they're going to be the ones who are going to be bringing people to me. And not as a manipulative tool, just as this is how things work. If we, if I take care of them, because they love it, they're going to bring people back. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflective Authors. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and you're listening to episode 222 of the Stark Reflections podcast. In today's episode, I have an interview with Brittany Fichter. Brittany Fichter is the author of Clean Romance and Happily Ever Afters. She lives with her Prince Charming, Little Fairy, and Little Prince in a decently clean castle in whatever kingdom the United States Air Force has most recently placed them. We have a fascinating conversation about writing clean romances, Happily Ever After, and particularly taking care of her readers. And that's coming up later in this episode. First, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices offers a platform for indie authors and small publishers to get their audiobooks out into the global market. More than 43 retail and library platforms, and that's constantly growing. Findaway, the mother company of Findaway Voices, was recently acquired by Spotify, so you know that means some awesome things are coming, and I am looking forward to having Will Degas back on the show in the next few weeks or months to talk about what this could mean for Findaway Voices, and in particular, what this could mean for independent authors. Now, if you are looking for a narrator, you can use Findaway Voices to find a narrator. They have a project managed system where somebody within the company will take care to find you the right person, or they're in the process of opening up their marketplace, which is very much like ACX, meaning you can go in and find narrators that you're interested in wanting to get to audition for your books. Now, once you have your audiobook available, you can put your own price in and pretty much control the price on every single platform. Well, except for one of them, Audible, which actually forces the setting of the prices on their own. But with 98% of the other platforms, you're in control of the price and you get access to promotions you can run through Chirp, owned by BookBub. Now, one of the cool things that I recently noticed about Findaway, particularly as I was going through the latest royalty report, is just how much money I'm earning through library markets and subscription markets, which are growing, as we know, in in the micropayments, in those cost per checkout, in those smaller models. So it's not as much money as you would get selling the full audio, but they add up over time and in many ways add up to being more than what it would have been had that platform just bought a single copy of the book. And that's long-term thinking. And I've always been about long-term thinking. Now, if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author to take control of your indie author empire, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. If you were paying attention to that little uh, audio read, that little ad read, I should say, that I was just doing for Findaway Voices, you may have heard some interesting sounds in the background. Uh, Early on, uh, Atticus, the cat, was up on the cat stand in the window, just tearing at the the platform with his paws, so I had to stop (laughs) 
<laughs> but you can still hear the beginning of him tearing at that. And just towards the end, just before I got to the end, now Liz got home from work and the dogs went absolutely ape. And they scramble down the stairs. You can hear their their um, their little hooves, hooves, <laughs> their claws uh, on on the floor. Uh, and then I pause. I close the door. But then you could still hear Maya as she loves to bark her head off uh, whenever anyone comes or goes from the house. So I didn't bother to re-record that. I thought I'd leave that in as a little special audio treat and maybe a reminder that if you use a professional narrator from Find Away Voices. You're not going to get that kind of noise in the background. Oh, Maya just went off again. Oh, well, what are you going to do? In any case, uh, I wanted to... Oh, my God, she's barking again. Can you hear it or is it just me? I know it's annoying me. I'm going to leave it in there because, you know, I'm not a professional narrator. This is just a regular podcast. But I am, uh, since I am mumbling about the things in my house, I am now going to share a quick personal update. I have been in the throes of the rewrites for Fright Night's Big City. Uh, I did push this back. Uh, It was originally supposed to come out in early December. I pushed the release date back to December 21st. uh, Because the rewrites are taking me a little bit longer and I keep digging in and, and building some stuff in. And some of it has to do with the next book that I've already started working on and I'm, I'm co-authoring that. I'll probably probably talk about that in a little bit more detail in, in a future episode, but um, that is, uh, yeah, there's stuff uh, for that next book, which is a backstory, but it's allowing me the opportunity to insert some details that will be really nice little nuggets for some readers to uh, who are very perceptive in, in any case and and maybe looking for those things so that's been uh, taking a long time it's going really really well I'm really loving it I'm really enjoying the process but one of the other things that I have done and I think I've hinted at this is I um, it is American Thanksgiving today as as I'm recording this it is November 25th 2021 and one of my favorite movies of all time is John Hughes, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. A 1987 movie, I believe. I'm holding holding a version of it on DVD in my hand. And it looks like, yeah, I can't read that. It's 1987 was when it was really Steve Martin, John Candy, sort of an odd couple. Uh, they, they basically meet each other on their way to fly from New York back to Chicago. Of course, things go wrong. The plane lands in Wichita, Kansas. And they are trying desperately to get home to Chicago uh, for for Thanksgiving, which is a very important uh, American event. And I love this movie because because they're mismatched. Uh, Steve Martin's uptight, John Candy's very easygoing, sort of lowbrow kind of guy. And it's just this amazing buddy movie. I laugh, I cry, I must have seen it 30, 40 times. I'm going to be watching it again this weekend with my son, who also loves the movie. Now, related to that, this is publishing news, is I have long been fascinated. There is a scene where John Candy's character, Del Griffith, is in the airport in New York, and he's reading a paperback when uh, Neil Page sits across from him, and then he's looking at him. And this is a scene where they're looking at each other, and they're not sure where they know each other from. And then John Candy's character, Del, says, I know you, don't I? I'm usually very good with names, but I'll be damned if I haven't forgotten yours. And and there was that misunderstanding where Dell actually ended up getting in the cab that Steve Martin had had to bribe someone else, um, uh, pay for to get, and and John Candy had come in and, and taken the cab, not realizing uh, it was his. You stole my cab. <laughs> I've never stole anything in my life. I hailed a cab on Park Avenue this afternoon, and uh, before I could get in it, you stole it. You're the guy who tried to get my cab. I knew I knew you, yeah. You scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> Come to think of it, it was awful easy to get a cab during rush hour. But it's a very subtle thing, but there's a scene where John Candy is reading a red mass market paperback. There's a, a, a model, a woman on the cover in a blue swimsuit, and, and she's sort of on her hands and knees, and it's got a red background cover, and it's called The Canadian Mounted. Now, this is a prop book, because I, I, I looked it up. It's a prop book. It doesn't exist. It's not a real book. It has never existed. And because John Candy is a Canadian actor, 
it was probably the 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 what is it the properties or the or the prop people uh, thinking this is funny we'll make a fake book we'll call it the Canadian Mounted it's obviously it's meant to be porn so it's obviously he's reading this porn uh, in in the industry they were called one handers uh, those that's what you would call um, <laughs> a, a mass market paperback that had uh, erotic content that's uh, that's what they were called back in the industry so he's reading this one hander it's called the canadian mounted it's obviously very funny because he has no shame he's just sitting in public reading this this porn uh so i i thought i always thought that was cool i thought that was kind of funny and then in deadpool 2 now ryan reynolds <laughs> the actor in deadpool is a huge john candy fan loves john candy but in deadpool 2 there is a scene uh, where wayne deadpool uh, he, he's going to the bathroom and, and he says he's going to be there for a while. You know, the, the joke is he's going to be um, uh, pleasuring himself. And he's got a copy of the Canadian Mounted. He's got a copy of this. Well, no, it's a, it's a slightly different version uh, of the cover, but it's obviously a nod to the John Candy book that was being read in planes, trains, and automobiles. And I went out of my mind. I thought, oh my God love John Candy, love Ryan Reynolds, and, and I don't just love all Canadians, but I do love those <laughs> actors. And I thought, this is perfect. Um, I'm, I'm doing a book called The Canadian Mounted. And initially I thought it was going to be, I thought, I'll do um, short stories and I'll get people to write short stories. And I want them to write a short story with the title, The Canadian Mounted, but it not be porn, not be erotica. It could be anything else. It just had to be called The Canadian Mounted and I was going to publish it. And then I was going to include some trivia from the movie, etc. So I started working on this book about six months ago, thinking maybe it was something that was going to be released this Thanksgiving uh, for 2021, and I, I, I didn't. I got into the trivia, I dug into the trivia, I bought numerous books, I've read dozens and dozens of articles, watched videos and, and movies and clips and read full books about John Hughes, about John Candy, and about the movie and uh, I have put up the Canadian Mounted for pre-order. It's on uh, plenty of platforms. I think it's everywhere but uh, Google. Now, uh, the print book is not going to be going up for pre-order for, for a while. But I'm having this release in uh, October of 2022. I am really thrilled. It's got some amazing content. I got, I got a hold of one of the early uh, scripts from the film. And so I've even uh, leveraged some of the cutscenes that were in the script, but well, they, there were there were plenty and plenty of hours filmed. The great thing about this movie is there's so much trivia. There's so much trivia. I'm so uh, I'm so excited uh, to share because I know that like me, there are other uh, there are other nerds who just love <laughs> love planes, trains, and automobiles. In any case, uh, I even did a I did a TikTok um, with a scene uh, from. From the movie, uh, the you play with your balls a lot scene uh, with Dell and Neil, and I played both characters, and, and I did that in my beloved car before my car died in July this summer. And I'll, I'll have a link to that in the show notes, of course. And of course, I'll have a link to The Canadian Mounted, which is at bookstoread.com slash The Canadian Mounted. But I am pretty excited about that. I had been hoping to get it out in time for this Thanksgiving, but I thought, no, I'm going to take the long view on this. It's up for pre-order. And I've still got about, it's only about uh, 60%, maybe 70% done. So I still have some work to do on it and I can chip away at it over the winter. And, um, and I'm pretty thrilled uh, to get that out there. So I thought I would uh, talk about that in this extended personal update. I knew I knew you. <laughs> uh, but now I want to welcome uh, new patrons to the podcast. So I've been I've been really pleased. Uh, it's been a patron a week for the last couple of weeks, and I'm and I'm pretty honored and, and thankful for that. And this week I want to welcome new patron James S. Aaron. Welcome James to the uh, patron group of the Stark Reflections podcast. Great to have you on board, James. You pushed it uh, as as it happened. Pushed me over the one hundred dollar a month mark, which means I'm going to be uh, posting in the next couple of weeks uh, a special. One hour, one-on-one -on -one chat. Well, it's not a one-on-one -on -one chat. It's going to be an open chat for me and any of the patrons who just want to come in and chat for about an hour or so. Ask whatever questions you want. We'll have some back and forth. I will be recording it, and I'll use that as content for a special bonus episode, courtesy of my awesome patrons. But I know that my patrons are going to ask some 
really fascinating things or even share some cool things that I think will be great for you guys uh, to listen to. So, James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks to you and thanks to all the people who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. Now, I know I have a corporate sponsor and I'm very grateful that Find Away Voices is my corporate sponsor and has been from very nearly the beginning. I really appreciate that they've been with me for this long haul as the podcast has grown over the years. But my patrons help support my time in producing the show. The uh, Find Away Voices, of course, pays for the hosting fees, which is fantastic. And of course, those hosting fees continue to go up as you awesome listeners continue to grow. And I need more and more bandwidth and space uh, for those episodes. So that's fantastic. And of course, the patrons who are supporting it are uh, showing me that extra support and love, which I do truly appreciate. And for that, I try to bring my patrons extra content extra value, extra bonus material, uh, some of which I posted uh, an additional um, audio-only excerpt uh, or or my full presentation from 20 Books uh, Vegas a couple weeks ago. I did, uh, right now, the Killing It on Kobo presentation was there a couple weeks ago. I put that up in audio, and then I've got the audio for uh, Wide for the Win. And very, very shortly, in the next few days, I'll also be adding the uh, the panel discussion with uh, John Williker, Cheryl Bradshaw, Diane Caprey, and uh, moderated by myself, uh, which is basically how to sell books on Apple, and that'll be coming to the audio feed. Yes, the videos are fully available on the YouTube channel for 20 books. There'll be a link to it in the show notes, of course, but I wanted my patrons to just have an easier way to access that audio as another way of saying thanks. There are additional episodes, additional bonus audio content for them. But I'm waffling and, and meandering and babbling uh, about that. But I just want to say thank you to my patrons. Appreciate you guys so much. And so now, with all that babbling out of the way, why don't we get right in to... It's not... You know, why do I say right in? I say that all the time. Does that bother you as much as it bothers me? Say, so why don't we get right in? Well, Mark, you're 17 minutes into the podcast. That's not right in. If you wanted right in, you would have been right in. So instead of uh, saying right in, why don't we get to the interview with Brittany Victor? Brittany, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Oh, I'm so excited to be chatting with you. So let's let's set the groundwork for people who may not be familiar with you. Your writing is about clean romance, happily ever afters. Is that a brand that you've always aspired to as a writer? It is. I tell everyone that it's something that I don't plan for my daughter to read my stuff until she's probably a teenager because I do have some pretty heavy emotional stuff in there and there's a little bit of torture, but I would never be horrified if she got it early. <laughs> okay, you're right, because it is clean, right? It is wholesome. Yeah. It, 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 is, it is a younger audience may be upset by some of the trauma that happens, but... I a lot of times they would probably be bored. They'd be like, why are these married people arguing? <laughs> <laughs> so is that something you've always, you've always written? I have. I remember writing, you know, kind of typical author thing. I remember writing as a little kid and then in high school. And I, one of the things, one of the reasons that I, I love writing so much is I have um, OCD and I have Tourette's and I have free floating anxiety and a lot of just fun, fun stuff that jumbles together. <laughs> and writing is a way that I have found to sort things out okay. and put them in perspective. And so for me, um, I str I've struggled with intrusive thoughts and, you know, dark feelings that are hard to escape thoughts that when I was little, I didn't know what they were, but now that I'm older, I can say, okay, that's the OCD. You know, we just, we can move on. This is, this is not me. This is that, but it has helped me put things in perspective. And so for me, the happily ever after is very important. Now I may make my characters go down to, you know, the depths of the earth and back to get there. <laughs> um, As one does. They, they're <laughs> going to, and, and, you know, I'm a Christian and I am, um, you know, a strong believer in keeping things clean as far as the, the romance goes. Now my characters get married and I do have a few fade to black scenes and I do have quite a few married jokes in there that my readers are like, my married readers are like, oh yeah, I get that. <laughs> and some of my younger ones are, are sometimes, I don't know if they get it or not, but um, okay. 
So, but everything is, it's very clean. If right. there is any married people time, it's off the page. <laughs> right, right. And that, and that said, for people who aren't familiar with sort of clean or wholesome romance, and that is that that you don't get into the, the, the graphics of the intimate nature of two people who yeah. love one another. They hold hands, walk off into the sunset, fade to black, and you assume mm-hmm. they're going to kiss or, or yes. whatever. <laughs> so does, does kissing, yeah. is kissing <laughs> permitted in a clean romance then? It is. And, you know, there's an ongoing argument between authors of what counts as clean and what counts as sweet because I didn't realize this. apparently sweet romance is a little bit spicier than clean and oh. for years I had it backwards and oh. um I love to listen to um the writing gals and they have a whole bunch of stuff on this because they all write clean but they all have slightly different levels of right. heat okay. and so um I have some friends there's not even you know I know there's some writers there's no kissing and then I have some writers that they get a lot spicier than I do. <laughs> okay, okay, um, okay. So yeah, that's that's the, I write, I will never write specific in the bedroom scenes. No, I might write scenes in the bedroom where they're arguing with each other. Yeah, yeah, but the, in the bedroom, they're, they're having other. a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but it, it's never going to be intimate moments. Those, my characters get to experience those behind closed doors. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to ask you for some of those episodes of, of the podcast you mentioned so I can include links in the show notes because oh, yeah, I'm fantastic. now fascinated. I mean, it, are there, are, is there a distinction? And, and I don't know, and this is the reason I'm asking, mm-hmm. uh, between uh, you know, a, a kiss, like a kissing a hand, kissing a cheek, kiss on the lips, open mouth kiss. I mean, does, did you get into those specifics of the, of the nuances? There actually is for one of the one of the writing gals put together like an entire sheet with the spectrum, but oh, again, wow. it, it depends on the, the writer. Right. And readers will generally find who they want to follow. Now, my readers, one of the things that they tell me most specifically is I like reading you because I know I'm not going to have any scenes that bother my conscience. Okay. Um, okay. And there I have a friend who writes clean, but her stuff again, it gets a lot spicier than mine does. It gets a lot closer to that closed door than mine does. Yeah. Um, and that's her level. But she again, she never I think the distinction between sweet and the next level is do you write those really intimate moments? Right. And yeah. generally sweet and clean will not get into that. Okay. It might get really close, but it's not going to get there. And then the difference between clean and sweet, those are that's a little murkier. Right. Um, I do kisses. And I do, um, like I said, I, if it's a married couple, especially I'll kind of show where they're going, but I won't go there. Um, but again, it's, it's a very much a spectrum. So would, you know, it'll depend on whatever author you ask. <laughs> okay. Well, cool. This, I find that, I find that so fascinating. I, I love that. So why is this genre? Why is happily ever after? Why is why is clean romance? Why is that something that's so important, especially now? Well, I've been obsessed with fairy tales since I was a little kid. But the thing that I loved the most was that they had a happily ever after. And again, I said, I'm a Christian. I believe in heaven. I believe that, you know, God's children will go to heaven and there will be a happily ever after. And especially in this last year, I have needed to remind myself of that. Yeah. It's been a long year and a half <laughs> for <laughs> And it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on or, you know, you, you're, it's been a hard couple of years oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, I, it, I often, um, I really make it hard on my characters. I, I know you interviewed someone, you interviewed one of the writers who works with Sean Coyne and I use the story grid method. And I actually, I have a method with my, um, my story grid editor where I actually write the full outline before I write the book. Okay. And my outline for this last book was 50,000 words. Well, um, with, with the outline was 50,000 words? Yep. And the so final... That, that, that was like, a, you just needed to add a little bit of flesh to it, like a little bit of skin. And it, was, that, it wasn't just the bones, it was the, the muscle and everything. It pretty much... Well, it, and the cool thing was I wrote 150,000 words in nine weeks afterwards. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> I have friends who can pump out 20,000 words in a day. I can't do that. <laughs> but it, it reminded me, going back to the original question, was... I need the reminder that the darkest, you know, the, the place where it's the darkest, there will be light, there will be dawn. It's right. not going to stay this dark. And a lot of my characters, my books are sometimes described as emotionally heavy. Now, again, it de- asks, depends on who you ask, but um, like in Clara Soldier, which is my book about, it's, it's a retelling of the Nutcracker. So it's historical fantasy, but okay. it takes place um, in my local area, actually near Fort Bragg. And it takes place post-World War II. 
where Clara's character, she's an adult and she sent her fiance off to World War II and he never came back. And she's really suffering, you know, from everyone thinks she needs to move on. And she's kind of stuck in the place of, do I move on? I don't want to let go, but I don't know what to do anymore. Everyone else has come home. And I ended up moving into it and it's, I ended up moving into the fantasy realm as part of her dream. Which again, in the original Nutcracker, the dream is never fully explained. We don't really know what the dream is. Right, um, right. And different versions of the Nutcracker have different endings. But in mine, it was really, she had to see that her fiance was going through PTSD. And yes, there is a little bit of Christmas magic and they do get there happily ever after. But the end, the end isn't all hunky-dory. It's, they get there happily after. They love each other. They're married. They're reunited. But he is still dealing with the trauma of he has PTSD and living in a military area, you know, and we lived on base for a while and now we're off base, but um, you really have to watch, you really have to see the effects of it in the people around us because the, this is the biggest base military base in the continental U S. And for example, I was in a, one of the military facilities and one of the stores there, someone was popping balloons because they were just trying to get rid of them. And we started, several of us started looking over and we had to go over and say, you know, I'm sorry, you, this is not a good way to get rid of those balloons. And they were shocked as to why. And we're like, that sounds like gunshots. Yeah. And this is a room, this is a building full of people who have been to war. You, you can't, you can't pop balloons like right. that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So it's just things like that. And I really wanted to get into life is going to be hard and it's going to scar us, you know, but it does make us stronger. And we had given it, it's a choice. You have to choose to, you know, am I going to stay here or am I going to move on? And Claire and James do move on, but their life is different because of it. Right. Now, my fairy tales, you know, they're full fantasy. They're, they're full fantasy, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's the same thing. They have to go off into a very deep place before they can come out. It's kind of like that scene in Lord of the Rings when almost all is lost and they say, look to, you know, the, what is it? The, the East on the fifth day. And they look and there's Gandalf, but they had to get to a horrible place for that to really have such an effect. Because if they had just been in a little skirmish, it wouldn't have been that, it wouldn't have mattered that much. But the fact that they went to their full extent, they said, we're going to sacrifice everything we have for good in order to get, you know, in order to defeat evil. That's why that dawn was such a miraculous thing. And you can watch it. I don't know if you like Lord of the Rings, but I'll sit there and watch it. And I just get chills every yeah. single time. And it's been out for 20 years now. So, <laughs> Well, I, I love, I love that. It's, it's kind of like the, the light is there, but sometimes you can't see the light until there is darkness around you. And then the light becomes clear and then the path becomes clear. And then this, and then the challenge, right. Becomes clear that yes, we have to do all of this. Mm -hmm. And go through all of that in order to reach that ultimate destination, the goodness that where where goodness can prosper and win and the, and the good guys can defeat evil. (laughs) It is. And there's, there's a, um, a Puritan prayer called the Valley of vision. And in the, in, there's a part, there's a line in it that says, um, it talks about how I'm, the words are fleeing me right now. I didn't get much sleep last night, but um, the stars are there during the daytime, but they only shine at night. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we're reminded of what true good is when we're forced to really face the evil. And we say that there is an evil in this world. We have to really, once again, look for good. We can't look for those gray spaces. We have to fight for what is right. Mm -hmm. And so that's really kind of one of the themes that goes throughout my books. I have several that tend to repeat, but, um, you know, as they say, you, you get the readers you have because they want the same experience repeated they just want a new situation (laughs) yeah Yeah, of course so okay so you you did the 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 retelling the modernization of the nutcracker set it locally Mm -hmm. um you you do have some familiarity with military family experience (laughs) etc the the fairy tales is it sort of like you take a classic fairy tale like snow white for example and Mm -hmm. then you've reimagined it Uh, is it is it historical is it modern or is it a combination of both it's very, very much medieval fantasy, sword, okay. sorcery, dragons type stuff. Um, but I expand them. So let me see what I hear. Um, when I was little, my grandfather got me these. And these, I, they've got chunks falling out of them. 
<laughs> oh, the world's um, best fairy tales. Okay, and cool. From the Reader's Digest anthology. Yeah. And I just, I read through them over and over again until the, like I said, they're starting to fall apart now. But <laughs> Sign I, of a well-loved book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I always wanted to know what more, because I knew, you know, the language isn't the same and, you know, the meanings are a little differently. And I know I, to me, I always wanted to know the characters. I wanted to know more than the archetype. And so as I got older, it was funny. I, I um, have been writing for my whole life basically, but when I was pregnant with my daughter, um, I had a really rough pregnancy and I was at home a lot more cause I just couldn't work. And um, I was reading Stephen King's on writing and he had one exercise where he said, um, write a, a story that you would never ever share with anyone else, but just write it and see what happens. And I thought, well, I'm not a good enough writer to do Beauty and the Beast. That's that's one of my all-time favorite stories of all. <laughs> obviously, it has withstood the test of time because people are retelling it, you know, one a day is releasing somewhere. Um, but I thought, you know, I'll try that. And within five minutes, I said, I have to finish the story. I need to know what happens. I really have to know what happens. And it started with the Beast, actually. It wasn't with Belle. I thought, what happened if instead of a monster, the Beast became a shell of himself? Okay. Maybe he was really powerful and strong and influential. And instead he became this haggard, old, hobbled, cursed man. What would happen then? And I knew as soon as that happened, I'm like, dang it, I got to tell the story now. <laughs> and um, I released it the week before my daughter was born. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and it was, I mean, this was in 2015. So I had a really terrible cover. I had I didn't get it proofread. This was back when you could get away with that more. Right, I right. didn't have it proofread. I had a terrible cover, but I had studied story. So right. I was selling, you know, I was selling a couple here and there. And then I got a cover redone and it started actually selling, but that was the intro. And then I thought, well, I could do this again. So I wrote <laughs> um, Little Red Riding Hood. And then I had a reader who begged me to write more stories about the first character. So typical indie fashion, I did something I would never recommend for anyone else. <laughs> I went back and made the first book into a trilogy and wrote two more. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and I retold um, Princess in the Glass Hill and Hansel and Gretel and okay. gave their, their families an arc. Um, gave their family an arc. And then the rest of the books for the most part are standalones, but they're in the same world. And I bring my original characters back in almost every single book. They're at least mentioned. So okay. it kind of ties the, the continent together. Right. Um, and I've started moving into, and I based the, the first one, you know, vaguely on Europe because that's where the original fairy tales take place. But I've started right. moving into what would kind of be like Africa. And okay. I did a retelling of the, um, the Frog Prince and based that on Egypt. And that was really fun. And it was funny because that's, I've described a lot of desert scenes. And one of my readers was like, she, she has such realistic desert scenes. And I'm like, well, I grew up in Las Vegas. So <laughs> I'm very good at heat describing heat. Familiar with the desert. Yeah. <laughs> heat and wind and sand. <laughs> so uh, 2015, was that the first book? And that was, and so, so sorry, the, the, the Beauty and the Beast um, modernization that you wrote, mm -hmm. what was it called? Um, well, it's not a, the, it's a, a trilogy before, now, right? Yes. Before beauty. And that is a, it's like I said, it's sword and sorcery, medieval fantasy. Right. Retail. And that's the becoming beauty trilogy, I believe. Right. Yeah. This is before beauty. Before beauty. Um, oh, beautiful that's, cover. And that's the, that's the revised cover. Yes. This is <laughs> okay. actually like the fourth cover. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that many iterations. Wow. Well, I had some issues with one of my designers who apparently he used an illegal photo. Oh, and no. so I panicked and found a new one and had to pay for like six covers to be redone because I didn't want to bet right. he might have done that with any of the others. Yeah, better to be safe, so, right? Yes. And so now I, I'm still using the one who did this for, I just had her do my like 10th book in that series. So, um, so yeah, that's their, they all kind of have that feel to them now. <laughs> wow. So uh, 2015, that was, that was your first novel? Yes. Okay, 2021 now, you say mm -hmm. you have 10 books. Now, wait a second, you also mentioned that you mentioned you were pregnant with your daughter. Mm -hmm. And so wait a second, how, how can a writer with young children, <laughs> how can a writer actually get these things done? Sleep when we're dead, no. <laughs> um, you know what, I love it because I have two kids now. And um, 
we have we have a lot of stuff going on <laughs> and we homeschool um Wait, you homeschool I, on top of that yes and uh we are we're in first grade right now and pre-k so we do stuff with the four-year-old mostly the six-year-old but um I, I write when nap time happens and for my daughter, it's just, it's rest time. She goes in her room and does whatever she wants, but, right. um, and then I write at night. So usually we'll put the kids to bed and then I will go work out at our base, our, our little neighborhood gym. And then I will, um, come back and write. And then I write till I'm falling asleep, <laughs> sitting up. <laughs> but I, I, um, I love story. And I, I don't, have you ever done the, uh, the strengths test that like Becca Syme, I think she went to 20 books for 50 K this year. She did. I saw her this year. I, I have not done that test. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I took one of, I took two of her classes and my first strength is individualization, which really focuses on understanding people and what makes them tick. And I, I think that's why I love character arcs so much is I, I cannot write books that are mostly just plot driven. Mine have to be internally driven largely as well. Right. So I, I kind of just chew on things as I do things. So, you know, taking okay. a shower, driving a car when I have moments, usually I'm sitting there and I actually have trained my brain. So I will make um, YouTube playlists for every book that I write. And they are usually, I don't reuse a whole lot of songs. Okay. And so I play that song repeatedly while I'm working on it, whether it's outlining or editing or writing. And so I know as soon as I turn the songs on, it's my brain knows it's time to work. Um, so really a lot of it is, I love it. So it, you know, I, I don't feel as burned out as if I, someone was telling me to do this, right. but I've, I'm also trying to find ways to, to not waste time and to train my brain. All right. It's time to work. We have to work now. Okay. So, yeah, but I'm, I'm very thankful for it because it allows me to stay home. I can make a little money, put some aside for the future and still get to do something I really love hmm. without having to leave my kids for it. Cause I, I do love staying home with them. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So, so you just basically schedule things out plan. I think I'm probably taking away your writing time. Now you mentioned it was nap time. <laughs> well, I'm an expert, so I also love people time. <laughs> okay. So, so people time. And so, but this, this may even be considered part of the writing business, right? As, as you're talking to someone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, and I, to not burn myself out, sometimes I have to take a break from the writing and I'll say, okay, I have to do something else. Like I'm teaching, I took the SPF course on cover design. So sometimes if I'm feeling like I just have no words today, I'll sit there and I'll design a cover okay. or I'll work on ads or I'll work on a class I've taken recently. Um, so, you know, it's, it's trying to keep everything balanced without, and that's another thing Becca Stein talks about all the time is not burning out because she right. said she's really starting to see writer burnout in major ways throughout the community because there's just that push for write faster, write harder. And again, unfortunately with the K, a lot of it goes back to KU, you know, Kindle Unlimited, people want everything right now. Right, yeah. And they yeah. want it yesterday. So, <laughs> you know, and I, I have friends, I have friends that put out, you know, gosh, they're like, well, I'm gonna have a book done in two weeks. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> this is terrifying. <laughs> But it's, it's working, it's largely learning how you write and how you can work and not pushing yourself beyond that. Okay. And so I actually usually outline a book for months before I write it. And in my head or on paper, I like right now, I've probably got at least seven or eight books in the process of being outlined up here or on paper somewhere. Okay. So um, paper then, I, I have to ask, do you write longhand? Do you type? How do you actually get the words out uh, for your manuscripts? Well, I've recently discovered Happy Planner, which is, it's, it's amazing. It's um, a form of planner that deals with discs. And this is my daughter's school one, but it's like where it has discs. And then you can pop the pages in and out in any order you oh, want. Oh, it's called Happy Planner. That's like a brand of, of, of folder or something. Yep. So you can pull it out. Whoops. As I drop all her stickers. So you pull it and you can put it back in in any order. So they also sell notebooks. Oh, and, 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 it, and it reconnects. It's not like torn. Yeah, you can pick it back in. Oh, that is so cool. Okay. It's perforated, and then you just pop them back on the disc. Oh, it's not, you're not tearing it. It's just a perforation mm -hmm. that re, yep. oh, wow. It's like, what is it? Little mini Velcro? <laughs> what is that? It's, well, it's just on the plastic. So let's see if I can hold this up. So um, you can see here, they're all okay. cut right there. And then you just, when you want to put something in, you just pop them back on. Pop them in and like they that. stay in place. That is so, and that's called Happy Planner. Uh-huh. And they have a, a notebook set. Okay. And so I love it because 
I'm always afraid I'm going to write things in the wrong order. And so I can pull out any page I want and just pop it where I want it. And it okay. sounds like a dumb thing, but for some reason that is really important to me. Um, <laughs> so you, so, so you do this for your outlines or you do this for the first draft? I will. I have usually three outlines. Um, okay. The first outline is like the brain vomit. It's just, it, you know, as it's coming, I'm writing it down. And usually that's when I finish doing something like I just, you know, it's been a long day and I took a bath and then things, you know, started to click up here again. Okay. <laughs> and so I just write down everything I can think of. And it's like incomplete sentences with lots of arrows and extra marks. And the second one then is an outline in more, um, chrono it's, it's in chronological form, but it's very short. It's like two to three sentences. And by the end of it, I've gone from two to three sentences to full paragraphs. Okay. And then the third outline is where I basically write the story. And like I said, what my story editor grid does is she, she edits my outline. So she doesn't edit the final version. She only edits the outline, but because it's a 50,000 word outline, I've written basically everything that's going in the story. Right. And so when I sit down, I know exactly what I'm going to do. Um, and it was funny because I had a friend who was like, are you doing nano? And I was like, well, I just did two months of 75,000 words a month. I think I'm good. <laughs> I, right I know I can get 50 done. So I don't die. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So, so I was good. Yeah. So you did not do nano rhymo this year, but you did yeah. two other 75,000 word projects. I did. And it made me kind of sad because this year I only put out three books, which for me, I almost always get four. Um, okay. But it was just, I, I was planning for this trilogy. And so you know, I spent a lot of time doing the trilogy, but I know is now that it's done, I'm hopefully, Lord willing, going to keep popping them out as they go. <laughs> and I've started a new project too, where I am writing a fairy tale to keep, just to keep the, the readers interested while I'm writing these ridiculously long books. I want them to be shorter. They won't cooperate. But, no, they're not going to listen. Uh, yeah. They're not listening. <laughs> um, but I'm writing a chapter a week and I'm posting it on my blog. Okay. And I, I will admit, I haven't done it in several weeks because I'm like, I'm like a week and a half away from publishing. So I'm trying to get everything done. Right. Um, but I've been publishing a chapter a week and that's been nice because it kind of cleanses the palate and it gives my reader something. And then when I'm done, I'm going to have a book done and basically ready to spit out that it's, you know, hopefully not going to, um, hopefully not going to take so long to get it ready. <laughs> I love that. So you've mentioned readers several times and I'm fascinated by that because you obviously pay attention to caring for and nurturing your readers. You even have on your website a fun and game section. Can you talk a little bit about why that interaction with your readers is so important? Well, I learned early on that readers are the ones who are going to carry you. And especially now with, I don't know how many books, you probably know better than I do, because I, I know it was in your book. I just don't remember the number, like how many like thousands or millions thousands of books going up every day on Amazon. And I'm trying to get out of the, I don't want my whole life to be on Amazon anymore, my whole group. So I'm, I'm moving out. I'm, um, but my readers are the ones who got me this far and I don't have a huge newsletter list. I have one, it's decent, but it's not huge, but I have the really dedicated ones that just give me such kind encouragement and tell me, keep going, you know, with, this is what we want, which what I write is not for everyone. I know that right, right. <laughs> I could probably get a bigger audience if I would pull back on the emotional heaviness of some of the books. I can't do that, but the readers are the ones who are going to carry you through because Amazon might send out its updated list of things, or they might see on a book bub, you know, somebody might see on a book bub ad, or they might look on Facebook, or maybe they're browsing the Kindle store or the, I mean, sorry, the Kobo store or the Apple store, but there's no guarantee that they're going to see right. your ad. But when you find that reader and you, you, you know, it's reader acquisition, it's going to be much easier to keep them and take care of them than it is to go out and find new readers. And I, I genuinely have fantastic readers. They are sweet and kind. And, um, you know, I, I don't have the hard and hard and fast statistics, but you know how they say for every reader you have, that's the best way to spread word of mouth. Right. And yeah. so I'm like, if I take care of my readers, they're going to be the ones who are going to be bringing people to me and not as a manipulative tool, just as this is how things work. If we, if I take care of them because they love it, they're going to bring people back. Right. Um, and I have a lot of readers tell me it, it was one of those, you know, little fish in a big pond moments where I had a friend from church told me that one of her friends had read one of my books and they were accidentally talking about it. And I was like, oh, someone's heard of me. That's weird. 
some of these are <laughs> really strange. And one of my other readers said she was talking with her music student about books and they started talking about before beauty. I was like, Oh, Oh, more than just my, you know, my family has seen. <laughs> it's like, it's like a sighting in the wild, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, and it, it's just one of those cool things that you're like, okay, but I want readers to come back to my website. I do not want them. I want them to hit the button, you know, alert to the store, alert me when the next book comes out, but I don't want to rely on that. Right. And so I have like personality quizzes on there. I have, you know, games you can play. Sometimes I'll run polls of one of my favorites was who's the best sidekick. Who's the, we had one of who's the best villain. And the answers were hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't just do my, the thing is though, you, I think a lot of people for a lot of early writers forget, they think it's all about them. It needs to be all about their books. And so I have a page on my website where I recommend reads, but it's not just my books. Yes, my books are there, but I have my friend's books that I trust or, and I, I will not put up a book that has content that I know my readers will not want. Right. So right, again, right. it's all clean. You know, it's all going to be clean content. Um, and it's, I'm not going to be putting, you know, James Patterson books <laughs> on my, <laughs> on my sweet rom my, my clean romance fantasy stuff. And then when, whenever we do the polls, I have the readers give me their favorite characters and I pit those characters against each other. So my readers may, my characters may get in there, but it's their favorites because I was reading the, the how to win friends and influence people. And a lot of readers, uh, uh, authors think I need to make this about me so that they know my name better. When really what I'm doing is I'm bringing entertainment. It's right. yes, my books are entertainment, but I want to, br I want to bring them to a place where they know they can come get more of what they enjoy. And so I also have a, I have a Facebook group where it's basically, we just nerd out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, I have things up there. Like lately I did one on Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Cause my, my absolute favorite book is Pride and Prejudice. So they have to put up with 50,000 Pride and Prejudice memes, but you know, I asked about Pride, Prejudice and Zombies. And so I let them answer and then they put their comments in and it's just fun. It's a really fun place to be. And I'm thankful for them, but to keep that, I have to take care of them. Right. Um, and taking care of them doesn't mean blasting by my book every post I make. So, right. and I'm, but when I do get ready, like right now I'm prepping a launch, you can bet I'm putting out graphics about my book, but of I'm course. also, again, I'm sharing, you know, geeky Star Trek, how to train your dragon crossover. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> And one of the other things I thought was great was um, you talk about one of the things you don't engage in with your reader groups or mm -hmm. on your polls or any of the uh, interaction is you completely leave politics out of it because you want people to feel welcome. You, you mm -hmm. want people to all feel included. You want them all to participate and, and throw out serious issues like well, who is the best sidekick or any of those <laughs> things, right? Yes. Is it Mushu? <laughs> he got up pretty high. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, again, it's, there's no, there's no hiding it right now is very politically charged and I have right. very strong opinions myself, but this is not the place for that. There right. are more than enough places people can go and yell at each other in comments. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, now, now tell me this, this is important. Uh, mm -hmm. What would Prince Charming's career look like if he worked a nine to five? Well, it depends on which Prince Charming we're working with. If we go from my with my version of Cinder Stars and Glass Slippers, uh, he would have probably probably been an Air Force Academy. Yeah. Because he loved the military. Either that or one of the maybe the Naval Academy. Um, he loved the military and his dad wanted him to leave that out. His dad wanted him in politics. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, I had I had a fun one with my uh my Autumn Fairy trilogy, which is not retellings, it's just an original series but i had them vote on i had them put put things in and so i went and made memes and had them do a final vote based on the four best ones that i thought and oh, they had a nice. great time with that um so yeah it's i i want people to come you know like i said i'm a christian i believe that everyone is made in the image of god and as such they deserve the respect and dignity of a human being you know as such and I may not agree with you, but I'm of, you know, the old fashioned belief that we can still be friends and be kind to one another and one another, even if we don't agree. Right, right. <laughs> I know that's not always a, a you know, a, a popular thing right now, but. Yeah. I mean, I'm, loving I'm, other people and respecting them, like, that's not a popular thing apparently right now. In society. On, on a lot of the social media. Yeah. No, yeah, that's, that's true. But, but this is a safe place, right? 
uh, your readers can come, they can engage, they can have fun, and mm-hmm. they don't have to worry about anything other than let's talk about these great worlds and characters and things yeah. that we're really passionate about. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I have read, readers sometimes who do try to draw me into some sort of one side or the other. And I will say a lot of my readers kind of know what side I'm on just based on my books, my worldview, right. but I'm not coming out and saying, okay, I stand with political A, B, and C points and, you know, right. I reject the rest of you. <laughs> That's not where I want to be. That's not the point of my storytelling. My storytelling is to highlight light, overcoming the darkness. And um, again, you know, if you read my books, you know probably what my religious stances are, what my political stances are, but I'm not getting pulled into that. Right. And they can try as hard as they want. I'm not doing it. <laughs> um Because it's unfortunately in the land of, you know, when you're online, things can be so misinterpreted. And so, and it, it's hard because I have a really close group of writer friends and we, we have like a constant chat open and we have our little group, but we've had to come together sometimes and say, okay, given the light of all the recent, you know, newsworthy things, um, how should I word this? Or should I answer this? How should I say that? And, um, you know, we discuss those things because we don't want to accidentally say something that later someone brings up in a screenshot that they've completely pulled out of context. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, I, I, and it, it, I will say there are some, it is definitely everyone's right to do what they want with their political standpoints. I will say as a reader, it has pushed me away from certain authors right. that I have, I love their stuff and I respected it. And then they came out with this really hateful remark about someone or something. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to read their stuff anymore. Right. because that's how they feel about someone like me. And I don't want my readers to have that. I want my readers to know, and I've told them this, even if I don't agree with you, you can still be here. I can still love you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just don't bring the politics with you, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just makes everything dark. But I love I, I love that, that your brand, uh, your care for your readers, the stories you tell is about happily ever after, is about light, and goodness overcoming evil and darkness, uh, you know, even if it's hard to get there, because it's not, I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be an interesting story if it was easy, right? And I think that's why, I mean, you know, we call him Grandfather Tolkien for a reason. That's why, you know, I'm in some Lord of the Rings groups. I'm, I'm a super nerd. And it's a good thing that my husband is also one because <laughs> enough normal people could stand me, but that's why we keep coming back. That's why people can post pictures of you know, Galatriel and Legolas and Aragorn and, you know, Gandalf over and over again. And it still invokes those feelings. Right. And I recently read um, Magician's Nephew with my daughter. Oh my God. I remember that. Yes. And yeah. <laughs> I read it as a kid, but as an adult, I was like, Oh, <laughs> I didn't see that as a kid. And so it was so powerful. And I was like, I can't believe I haven't read this 10 times since the first time I read it. Now I have read Line the Witch in the Water repeatedly. Of course. <laughs> but it was just this emotional experience. And that's what I want my books and my whole brand to be is to, to remind people to, to really give them that experience because right now the news is not giving it to us. And unfortunately, I think one of the issues with 2020 is we were so on our phones and our devices all the time and we weren't together that there was a lot of miscommunication. We were missing that person to person, things you would never say to someone's face. Right. You would type it out on a screen and you're hidden. And uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> um, I tried very hard. And, you know, again, this is an all authors thing, but I really tried. I would do videos with my my readers. Um, we had things where we we would start a movie all together on like Disney Plus and we would all watch it at the same time. Oh, it yes. <laughs> we did that a few times. We did that with Aladdin. One of the others, of course, usually Netflix would like pull something off the day I wanted it. Yes. <laughs> we'd have to scramble and find a new movie. Um, we did that with Princess Bride. But it's things like that, the creating the community and have them coming back for more and knowing that they can get good stuff right there and knowing that they can get that encouragement because everyone needs it right now. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Well, awesome. So I, uh, I want to ask you, so for any listeners who are just getting started, they're getting ready, maybe to release their first book, maybe, maybe they're just finishing their first NaNoWriMo novel, and they're getting excited <laughs> about those next steps. What advice would you give to, uh, to writers who are just getting in just getting involved? 
Well, I know I will caveat this with some of my other writer friends strongly disagree with this. And that's, that's a, that's because of people write differently. Right. Um, But I studied story before I released my first book. I studied story. I read all sorts of everything I could get my hands on, on the craft. And I don't mean don't write and only read, but to this day, I'm still trying to I'm still trying to pull craft in. I'm still trying to learn more about how to make my stories better. And again, the push for getting the books out as fast as you can. I want to write fast. I'd love to do a book a month. I can't, (laughs) but I'd love to. But really studying story and thinking, understanding what makes people, what do they want? What experience do they want from this? And you get that by reading books. And you get that, like I said, I have a whole set of books over here on how to write, how not to write. One of my favorites, I'm getting the title wrong, but it's like 101 things not to do in your writing or something like that. And so I studied story and that was the main thing. Cause if you have missing commas everywhere, but you have a good story, people are going to come. And it amazes me. I have a bunch of readers to this day who come and they'll say, this is the first book I found. And I loved it. And I'm like, really, really? Cause it wasn't proof. (laughs) I've gone back and fixed it since then. And they're like, oh yeah. And that's not a testament of how great of writer I am, but it is a testament of applying the things that I have learned and learning from people who have made the mistakes for me. (laughs) Um, The other thing would be in this day and age, you have to have a good cover. You really have to have a good cover. (laughs) In the old days, we could get away with not having one because there just weren't that many books. But these days you really have to study the group. And, you know, and I've heard it said again and again, find the genre you're writing in look at the top 10 covers in that genre, find the elements that match and don't copy them, but find the elements that, that match because there's a reason they're doing well. And if your cover stinks, people are not picking it up. They're not going to, they're going to be like, well, I could find these 10 other covers that are really good. So again, even if you have to, you know, chintz on a little bit of the proofreading or you have to hire someone who maybe isn't the ideal, you know, thousand dollar editor, learn story get a new cover, get a good cover. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Brittany, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Can you please let my listeners know where they can uh, go and find your fun and games and all the other cool things about you online? Yeah. Um, you can find me at BrittanyFictorFiction.com uh, and Fictor is F-I-C-H-T-R. It's a, this hard name that I, like I said, I misspelled it the first time I wrote it. I wasn't married yet, but <laughs> um, we weren't dating it either, but uh, he was cute. But yeah, so BrittanyFictorFiction.com and that's where you can get everything. And if you sign up for my newsletter, I actually release short bonus stories for every book that I write. So I have like two or three dozen up there now, and that comes out free. And so I, and I notify people of sales and stuff. And then I have Facebook book and Brittany Fichter is it Brittany uh Brit's fellow fairy tale fanatics is my group and like I said we're just a bunch of nerdy people I do screen people to keep you know the bots <laughs> the oh, bots yes. away. we got lots of fun bots but yeah so and then you can just type in my name Brittany Fichter fiction and Facebook and it'll come up so yeah that's where you can find me and uh and I'm on Instagram too but that's kind of hit and miss I am doing a retelling of Pride and Prejudice using Funko Pops oh, wow. on Instagram which is again totally geeky it's just one of those creative outlets to keep myself from burning out. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with that. So, <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll have links to all that in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Awesome. And Brittany, thank you again so much for hanging out with me today. Thank you. And again, thank you so much for all you do for the author community, because it has been a huge encouragement to me. And I um, I ordered your book from Barnes & Noble as soon as I figured out how I could. So <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Have a great day. I wanted to reflect on that attending to your readers. And Brittany said something really profound that I want to pause and and reflect on. And she said a lot of writers think it's about them, but it's really it's really all about the readers. And and she and she makes a point of that in the experience for her newsletter, for online, for the fun and games that she has on her website. The trivia is trivia related to things that people are interested in, like fairy tale tropes and, and, and all of those things that she knows is drawing people to want to read her stories. The trivia is not about her. It's not about the characters in her books. It's about generic characters that everyone knows, that everyone can talk about, that everyone can participate in. It not only opens it up to other people who may be interested in, 
in the tropes, in the genres, in the high level, you know, fairy tale world, etc., who may then discover Brittany. So she's not thinking about herself. She's thinking about the readers. Evidence in the fact that, you know, she doesn't let politics, etc., sort of muddy the waters of, of, of people just coming together and talking about something that they're passionate about. It doesn't leave room for that um, divisity that, uh, you know, is, is, is creating rifts, huge rifts in society because she's writing happily ever afters. Everyone's happy at the end. The good guys win. Light prevails over darkness. Clean, wholesome, good-natured romance. Yes, there's darkness. She talks about Tolkien and just how dark it had to get before the dawn. But I love that uh, about that. And that but that's, that's an important thing. When you're thinking about your author newsletter, when you're thinking about the stuff you're putting out into the community, is it about them or is it about you? And I love the fact that Brittany's thinking about the readers and what they would find interesting. So when you're thinking about content for your newsletter, yes, of course, you're going to update them on what you're up to. And maybe you're going to update them on interesting books that you've read that you think they might enjoy. Or maybe you're going to talk about things that you're really passionate about. I know, for example, and I'll use this podcast. Yeah, of course, I talk about myself a lot because... My personal update, I'm talking about the things I'm writing. But when I was talking about planes, trains, and automobiles and me publishing that Canadian uh, mounted book, perhaps very likely you're not interested and will, won't want to buy that book because you're not as big of a, of a nerdy fan as I am. But it made you think about a movie maybe that you hadn't thought about in a while, especially this time of year, Thanksgiving, which is when <laughs> usually when I watch it every year. And, uh, or American Thanksgiving, I should say, you know, I, I, I watch it in October sometimes. And then again, in November, <laughs> I can get, I can get it twice. But when I talk about something like that, I maybe go, oh yeah, I remember that. Or, well, that wasn't my favorite John Hughes movie. My favorite John Hughes movie was Christmas Vacation, or it was this, or it was that, or my favorite film with Steve Martin in it was this. Because the minute I start talking about something that I'm interested and passionate in, you are thinking about the things that you're interested in, passionate, and sometimes you connect, and sometimes we don't. As, I, as I've been saying to some writers lately, it's that pineapple on pizza principle. <laughs> it's the, um, if I say pineapple, I love pineapple on pizza, especially hot peppers and pineapple. I think the sweet and the, and the hot go really, really well together. It's going to stir up some conversation that's you know controversial but not divisive. <laughs> People are not going to we're not going to not talk to each other because I like pineapple on pizza and you don't. But you're you're either gonna most likely you're you're not you're gonna kind of be either really for it or really uh, against it, uh, and that's okay because we're talking about that and we're talking about different food combinations and that may spin off other conversations and that's part of an engaging community, which is what Brittany's doing. She's engaging with the community and having fun with them and 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 just throwing out some interesting topics of conversation, and so that's the kind of thing that I wanted to focus on that I'm gonna try and take back and do a better job of as I'm gearing up to my um, end of November 2021 newsletter to my readers. But think about the ways that you can do that as a writer as well. Well, that's it for this episode. That's it for the reflection. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Brittany. I hope you enjoyed the other content that came before and after the interview with Brittany. Thank you so much for spending your time with me listening to this podcast. It means so much to know that you, yes, you, right on the other end of this, that you're listening to this right now. If you want to leave comments, you can leave them over at starkreflections.ca on any episode of the podcast. You can also email me mark at marklesley.ca. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre saying, Hey, knew I knew you. <laughs> Nah, <laughs> uh, I knew I knew you, of course, but, but this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre saying, here's wishing you a really happy Thanksgiving if you're an American listener. Uh, also, just a happy Friday and, and, and Thursday of November um, the 25th and 26th, wherever you are in the world. And also wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. 
You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. You know what would make me happy? Got a couple balls and an extra set of fingers. <laughs>